Hello everyone, welcome back to Clinical Psychology Community UK. My name is Holly and I am currently an NHS assistant psychologist. So today it's a Monday, it's a new video. We are going to talk about assistant psychologist interviews. Ah, the dreaded interviews, scary times. But we're going to talk about it today and it's going to be all right. Before we start, don't forget to follow us on all of the social media. I will make sure that um, I put a post on the Instagram page and I put any information that comes out of today on the Facebook page as well. And click subscribe and you'll get all of the updates um, for all of the new videos. And I've got loads and loads planned this year. So make sure you click subscribe. Okay, today we are going to give you some information about interviews, some types of questions that you might have, um, some example questions and answers, and some top tips, practical advice. Um, things that you can do pre-interview, during the interview and post-interview. Okay, let's move on then. Information about interviews. For anyone that hasn't interviewed before, don't worry, I'm going to try and set the scene a little bit for you. And for anyone that has, maybe you can just check, check your experiences against this list. Okay, so COVID. Things are obviously happening remotely. Um, usually interviews would invariably happen in person. Um, and quite often you will have at least two interviewers. I've never had an interview where I've had one person. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that um, the interviewers will, will have a list of the questions and they will also have a kind of marking criteria that they're marking your answers against. So uh, for example, if the question is, can you give us a, an example of um, a time where you're able to be organized? or you know how you are with technology or something something like that you saying i am proficient in microsoft office i am able to use spss for sort of some some undergraduate level statistics they will be able to tick all of that stuff off and give you a score for each answer so having two interviewers means that you have a, two different scores to compare um so it's kind of a little bit more objective i suppose but also panels are very common. So it's very common to have more than two interviewers, um, you know, potentially three, four interviewers. I've had multiple occasions where I've had that. Um, so bear in mind that you will probably not just be one on one with someone, <laughs> um, but all of the details of the interview that you will be invited for um, will be in your invitation email as well. So the interview tends to begin with an introduction to all of the interviewers um, and the service that they work for and the role that you're interviewing for. They will also probably like check your ID potentially and just, you know, or just confirm your name and just check that you know what role you're applying for. They might even read out some of the role information as in you're, you're, you're interviewing today for assistant psychologist position. That's a band four or band five position working in this service, this many hours, full time. That sort of stuff is what they'll confirm. There can be a variable amount of questions, okay? So in my experience, I've had three interview questions and I've also had 15 interview questions. But quite commonly, I mean, it's around five to nine, probably, somewhere in there, probably. Um, the job that I'm current that I am currently in um, as an assistant psychologist was three questions, um, which really surprised me. So don't be surprised if you do get three. Um, questions will reflect the job description and person spec. So when you are invited for an interview, make sure you review that job description and person specification um, because that's where they'll get their questions from. You know, and there can be some NHS and non NHS differences. Um, in my experience, interviewing non-NHS, um, there tend to be more atypical questions. And what I mean by this, a couple of examples, um, one that I had last year sometime, year before maybe, was use a psychological theory to explain why you're sat here today. Like I've never had a question like that before. Um, I started talking about CFT, compassion focused therapy, because that's something that I'm really interested in at the moment. Um, and it went down well. That was the feedback that it went down well. But there are quite often atypical sorts of questions that you won't find in NHS interviews. Um, but that will become a little bit clearer as we go through as we go through today. OK, types of questions. So this is based on my experience. I'm not necessarily an expert. You know, I've I have experience of doing lots and lots of AP interviews. 
um, as a candidate, but I've also done interviewing when I was a team leader in my last role. Um, so I kind of, I have experience from both sides and I absolutely encourage you, if you ever have the chance to be an interviewer, I would encourage you to do that um, because it gives you a different perspective on, on interviews and, and things like that. So I have sort of grouped all the questions into three categories. Competency, which is essentially, you know, what experience and skill you have. What, what are you competent in? And that could be, you know, clinical supervision. It could be clinical skills like building relationships, therapeutic alliances. Um, it could be, um, you know, assessment, formulation, intervention, working as a team, reflective practice, ability to sort of manage your own workload and your own well-being. It's all that sort of stuff about competencies. The next one's about knowledge. So as an assistant psychologist, I've never seen an assistant psychologist position where a, a psychology undergraduate degree is not an essential thing. Every AP has to have a, a, an undergraduate psychology degree, essentially. And that is because they want you to have that basic foundation knowledge of psychology, of theories, of you know, critiquing articles, of doing literature searches, of, you know, understanding psychological stuff. They want you to have that basic knowledge. Um, so questions are usually confirming that you have some sort of knowledge. Um, but it also, you will likely get questions about, you know, the given population of the service that you're interviewing for. You know, if it's eating disorders or personality disorders or primary care, they probably want to know what your understanding of, of those presentations are and the population. Um, you know, if you're going for an interview in CAMS and children and adolescent mental health services, they want to understand what your understanding is and your knowledge is around mental health issues in children and, you know, policies and procedures and things like that. Um, so fully expect that, I would imagine. And the third one is scenarios. So what I mean by this is a question that's formed like you are in clinic one day and X, Y and Z happens. What do you do? So here they're trying to assess what sort of person you are, whether you can think on your feet, what you would actually do in that situation. And here they're kind of assessing what sort of level of training you need. Um, when if you are successful are you able to walk straight into the job um, because you know what to do already um, you know is there minimal training um, and that these sorts of questions are testing both knowledge skills experience they're testing everything is just putting it in a different sort of framing it in a different way basically they want to know how you'll act in the role really that's that's sort of the the basic thing of scenario questions so those are the three different types and what we're going to do i'm going to give you some different example questions and i'm going to talk through some ideas for an answer um it's not going to be structured particularly as it, as if it were an interview answer i'll try but it's it's tricky okay let's look at competency ones first so this is a very common one um there'll be some form of this somewhere in your interview i would imagine i mean i've probably been asked this in like 80 to 90 percent of the interviews that I've been on for assistant jobs so the question is tell us about a time where something went wrong what did you learn from it so one thing to bear in mind is to use structured approaches to answer your answer the questions and I don't what I mean by that is not to think of every single question and write down an answer and memorize it that's not what I mean what I mean is um saying thinking uh you know using the star model situation task action response which is what i'm going to do in this example okay so the situation that i have um is that i was working with a complex client um in substance misuse they had some quite we had some difficult communication issues between us um it, you know there was query learning disabilities and and confirmed severe autism um, on, on the part of the client and they were also in for sort of query alcohol dependency we weren't quite sure what their level of alcohol use was so that was the situation the task that I had was to identify their goals with them you know work together co collaborate and produce a care plan um, and help them achieve those goals by you know putting in an intervention plan that we could stick to so the actions, this is the biggest part of the answer. So the actions, I, you know, I read through all of the assessment paperwork that was done by the assessor, the assessor and any existing notes. I requested a GP summary and any letters from any professionals. I referred to our complex case meeting. Um, I updated the risk assessment regularly, like 
nearly every day at one point because it was it was ongoing um i booked an appointment with me the client and their care support worker i referred to adult social care i tried to assess alcohol uh, use and motivation for change but it was very very difficult i had lots of questions you know could they not understand me could they understand me but not able to verbalize it back to me their answer or could they understand me and they didn't want to be here could they just not verbalize that they didn't want to be here or were they being forced into being there by by the support staff who knows um, because you know the support staff had a duty of care to this person to make sure that they're not you know excessively drinking um which kind of brought in lots of capacity concerns and things like that so we booked fortnightly meetings i took to supervision and um, to line management supervision because i didn't have any clinical supervision at that time we liaised with the multidisciplinary team. You know, the psychologist gave me some really good suggestions on working with people with learning disabilities and autism because it's not an area that I've worked with before clinically. Um, so those are the actions that I took. Now the response. OK, so eventually the client's time and treatment was too long without any change. And this was more of a service delivery thing. So the time and treatment was very rigid. Someone that was in for, for example, cannabis use uh, had to be seen within six weeks, had to finish their treatment in six weeks. Someone with dependent alcohol was 12 weeks, um, for example. So all the different substances and dependencies had different limits. But this person had exceeded the 12 week limit um, and he was discharged. Uh, it wasn't my favorite choice at all uh yeah it just wasn't wasn't the outcome that anyone really wanted so that is how to sort of structure your answer and i hope that kind of makes sense um you know you've we've gone through the situation task action and response so now we think about what did i learn from it and this is your opportunity to be super reflective um, and in and my understanding, you know, of, of that, that example, importance of the psychological assessment and formulation, you know, the service delivery model was not for purpose for this client. Um, it was all about group based working and this person could not do group based working. There was some challenges of MDT and interagency working, um, different opinions and priorities in the service. I also learned about my confidence in raising concerns because I didn't feel confident enough in my voice at that time to be able to raise concerns as forcefully as I needed to I think and on reflection I've learned that actually that is the best time to use your voice if you have concerns um and I also learned that reflective practice would have helped me in this situation because it's not something I was really engaging in when I was in the role but since that's definitely something I'm doing so I hope from that answer you can kind of see some of the competencies that I'm that I'm displaying so we've got reflective practice ability to use clinical supervision clinical skills knowledge of mental health issues critical thinking skills risk assessment and management teamwork organizational skills recognizing and competence levels presentation skills communication skills values all of these things are things that you could include in your answer and there'll be loads of other things as well but in my answer you know, we spoke about reflective practice, clinical skills, critical thinking skills, risk assessment and management values, recognising and competence levels, communication skills, presentation skills and teamwork. Those were the main things that, that we spoke about in that answer. And that gives them so much information to just tick off on their on their sheet, you know, on their marking scheme. They can say, yep, they mentioned this, 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 this high score. That's essentially what I mean. Um. But what can be helpful is to, because this question is very common, what can be helpful is to think of a case study like I have. So I've thought of a case and I've structured it already. So you kind of have it in mind. But every time I do this, it's a different way that I use different wording, a different language. So I'd encourage you to have like a, a case example in your head, looking at a time when something went wrong and also looking at a time where something went well. So you can adapt those case studies to whichever question you get. And another example of a competency question um, is give us an example of a time where you used a CBT approach with a client. What was good and bad about using a CBT approach in this example? So this could be any approach, but it's likely to be CBT because, you know, everything is CBT, particularly in IAPT and on doctorate programs. Lots of psychological therapy services are CBT. 
But if you're working, if you, you know, you're interviewing for a dementia service, knowledge of the Newcastle model might be helpful. Uh, you know, eating disorders, CBT with eating disorders might be helpful. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, any adapted form of CBT dependent on the population would be helpful to know about. So I decided in this when I was thinking about it is and I thought this immediately it's not just that I've sat down and prepared this I thought this immediately when I saw this question is to use the Gibbs reflective model to structure my answer and I have done a video on Gibbs as well which I'll link down below um, if you're interested in learning a bit more about it but the reason that I thought about it immediately was the Gibbs model contains a section where you are thinking about what was good and what was bad about using that approach it has good bad evaluation stuff in it so that's why so the main ways that I'm going to answer the question are what what was the situation what what is the example thoughts and feelings that seemed significant and the good and bad things about using that approach because that follows the Gibbs sort of structure I'm not going to use the full Gibbs model because I'm missing out the bits at the end like critical appraise, appraising and things like that but I'm using the first three. So what was the situation? Well, I was working with a client, um, 88 year old female um, running a pilot psychoeducational course, which was CBT based and uh, looked, you know, it sought to increase self-esteem. She had long standing issues and low self-esteem anyway. And she actually was a secondary care client that was referred to me in primary care just to help pilot the course. The course was six sessions and it ran once a week and it was roughly one to two hours each session. We evaluated the course um, using the NHS Wales outcome measures. Um, so we used uh, the Requal 20, we used um, a goal-based measure and we also used a patient sort of satisfaction survey type thing. We identified difficult early experiences, core beliefs, rules for living, trigger situations, anything that kind of makes us have a deeper understanding of what low self-esteem is for this person and I also developed all of the materials uh, for the pilot um, adapted from a sort of general primary care course. So what were my thoughts and feelings that seemed significant? Well I was really anxious because I'm quite a naturally anxious person anyway uh, it's like my default setting um, so managing my own anxiety around piloting the course and making sure that I sounded like I knew what I was talking about was a, an important thought and feeling that that felt significant to me. I was also really excited because this was the first time I was trying out the course materials on someone. I was quite pensive, you know, I wanted to learn and I wanted to reflect. I really wanted to get my teeth stuck into this opportunity and draw out any learning that I could. Um, I was also really hopeful that the pilot course would would be successful and that we would get lots of people so the evaluation then so what was good and bad what was good I mean the CBT approach was familiar to the client and it made sense to her it was logical they were able to identify some goals they were able to identify some difficult experiences that precipitated the low self-esteem um the course and the CBT base was sort of thought to be acceptable and feasible with this with this person and I think we built quite a strong and trusting therapeutic alliance, even over the phone, which is how it was being delivered. And the guided discovery sort of worked, I think, as well. So there were lots of things about the CBT approach that really worked. And we also included a, a sort of formulation assessment type situation at the beginning before the course started. So that helped us in when we were doing the intervention because we could pick out lots of information that was important. What were the bad things? Okay, so the, the client actually didn't make any improvements on the outcome measure. They actually got worse in terms of the outcome measure. Their psychological distress increased. But bearing in mind, we were doing this during COVID and remotely, and they felt technology was quite challenging to them, and they felt very anxious about using computers and things like that. Uh, that, that could account for it, but it's difficult to tell. Um, the client also didn't really fully reach her goals, which was difficult. Um, it wasn't necessarily a person-centered approach um, because the intervention wasn't necessarily tailored to the client. It was tailored to her age group, but not necessarily tailored to her. Um, and there was some real difficulties with behavioral activation and the activity scheduling. There were some real issues with that, partly because of fears of COVID. So thinking about the competencies that I've given you in that 
answer. We've got, again, reflective practice, clinical skills, communication skills, all of these different things. These are the things that we've got that I've managed to answer. So again, in the marking scheme, they'll be ticking off different things that I've hit in that. And you're also answering the question using a reflective model, which gives you massive like tick points, I think. Here are some other examples of competency questions. And these are just examples, okay, um, of things that I've had in interviews um, and things that you might expect, but definitely look at the job description and the person's spec. So you can sit down and think, okay, so what are the competencies that I need for this role? These are probably things that I'm gonna be asked about. You can think about it that way. What helps and hinders you in supervision? Give us an example of a time where you had to manage your own caseload. What were the biggest challenges? Demonstrate how you've previously assessed and managed risks before. Describe a conflict you've experienced at work and how did you resolve this? So a lot of the competency questions are based on actual experiences that have happened to you and what competencies you've gained because of that. So that's a really important thing to think about. And for competency questions, have a couple of vignettes, just, just a couple of case studies that you can pick on or examples of situations that you can pick on um, to, to you know, answer your questions in interview. You don't have to name them word for word. You know, as I say, it will change every time. Moving on to knowledge questions then, the second in our category, an example knowledge question. Why is multidisciplinary team working important in the NHS? the service or with this client group, for example. And what they're testing here is, um, you know, what's your understanding of multidisciplinary team working, MDTs? Uh, why is it important? They're asking you a little bit about the NHS. They're asking you about the service, the client group. They're testing your knowledge on all of those things. So, I mean, you can, again, I would encourage you just to think a minute when you're answering a question to just spend a bit of time thinking and what your main points are and then say okay so I think you know the way I respond to this is that there are three main issues for example the main reasons I would say you know are to ensure that all aspects of client care are considered um, to meet the evidence-based guidelines to hold each other accountable um, because all of these things will lead to the best quality of care and then you can go into what each of these things, you know, you can elaborate on each of these things. So firstly, to ensure that all aspects of client care are considered. So in my experience working in weight management, we had a multidisciplinary team that was very well defined and it had a psychologist, a dietitian, a consultant endocrinologist, so a doctor of hormones, a physio physiologist, um, physiotherapist uh, and support workers um, and nurses and, and health trainers and things like that. And each discipline really does have an input into why people gain weight and why they really struggle to lose it. You know, the dietary side of things is massively important because that's quite often how you gain weight. Again, the physio side of things, making sure that they have safe exercises that they can do. And the psychologist, if there is any sort of disordered eating or distorted thinking patterns around eating and food and weight, then that's a massively important thing. So for that client group, a multidisciplinary approach is huge um, because all of these factors need to be considered. And in an MDT, it is considered. Similarly, in substance misuse, which is my previous role, you know, clinically, we had doctors, prescribers, nurses, healthcare assistants to look after the physical side, because a lot of the time in substance misuse, they're quite poorly. Um, people that might be using heroin quite often are very, very slim, very malnourished, uh, tired a lot of the time and quite often have um, low levels of self-care. So uh, potentially not even able to wash, but they have open injection sites, you know, that sort of stuff. So doctors took, and nurses and healthcare took care of that side. And then we have the more recovery workers, psychology, family therapy sort of side of things, which does the psychosocial stuff. Um, and those approaches are absolutely needed um, in order to look after all of the main things that happen to someone in substance misuse and to help them best get to recovery you do need the physical side to be looked at and you need the psychological side so that's why in my experience it's been massively massively important so you get all aspects of client care are considered the second thing is the evidence-based guidelines so uh, looking at the nice guidelines the nhs um you know mdt working guidelines the nhs 
uh, five year, 10 year plans, all of that stuff you can mention and say MDT working it has been shown to be effective. It's been shown to be a good way to ensure quality care, that sort of stuff. Touch on the evidence base because it shows your knowledge of the evidence base and also um, to hold each other accountable. You know, when it's just one person working with one person, um, it's it's easy to fall into the expert client power dynamic. Whereas if you have a multidisciplinary team, actually you're all you're all working together on the situation. So that's an example of another version of a structure for an answer. You you know you think think about it for a second and give your top three top five reasons that it's important. And what I've shown here is all of this knowledge. OK, there's loads of knowledge here that we've shown. So, again, touched on guidelines, touched on client groups, touched on, um, you know, other disciplines and the value of other disciplines, the role of a clinical psychologist, because they want you to understand that. That's an example of a knowledge question that, again, is quite a common question. Um, and I hope that kind of makes a bit of sense as to, to how to structure your answers. And I, I wouldn't just encourage you to structure your answer on, on a particular question. I'd encourage you to do it all the way through your interview because it, it I, we're human beings. We like structure. So when I've been interviewing people and they think about it for a second and then they list the top three reasons and then they talk about them and then they summarise, it's a way nicer answer to listen to than someone going, uh, and, and this, and, uh, 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 which is a little bit what I do. But here are some other examples of knowledge type questions. What factors should be considered in a thorough risk assessment? Detail and model of psychological formulation. How can working from home impact team working, which is a very common one during COVID, by the way? Uh, which factors contribute to staff burnout and how do you protect your own well-being? Again, that's that's a very topical one at the moment. What are some of the challenges with MDT working, as we've sort of sort of touched on? And what are some of the unique issues with working psychologically with children? You will get questions on the population that you're working with. You will get questions on the presentation that you're working with you will because that's what they want to test um, they have to distinguish between us somehow some more examples um explain a systemic approach you know this is particular if you're working with children and families that's a very very common approach what do you think stepped care model means those sorts of terms are very commonplace in sort of IAP services and primary care so having an understanding of what those mean if you don't know, by the way, you can just say, you can say, oh, I'm not actually sure what that means. I could take a guess and then take a guess. And then you could say, but I know what I would do. I would um, ask my supervisor. I would do some independent research um, and bring it to supervision because that's a way more honest approach and a way more likable approach than, than trying to bluff something that you actually don't know about. And that's something I did a lot in early AP interviews, loads. I re I'd like pretend that I knew what I was talking about and I didn't. Um, and it showed and I did not get chosen. <laughs> um, but now I feel much more confident to say, I don't actually know, but this is what I would do. You know, much more likable. What are some of the ethical issues in working with clients with brain injuries? That can also go hand in hand with children or dementia patients or um, learning disability, autism or people who might lack capacity or particularly working in secure settings as well. How can you ensure interventions are inclusive for those with individual needs? What do you understand this role to involve? They want you to understand, they want to see your understanding of what the role actually is and see what your level of research is um, into the service. And what are our trust or service values? This is something when I used to be an interviewer and we were choosing questions, this is something we chose a lot because we wanted to see how much research they had done about our service and how much knowledge they had. Um, and it was an, like almost an instant, pff, they don't know about our service. Well, why would we give them a chance at, at, at the job? You know, so that's an important one to look at if you get an invitation. Moving on to the last one. We are on the last one, which is scenarios. These are very, very common. And I've never had an interview where I've not been asked some sort of scenario question. So you will be asked one. The example that I'm going to focus on is this. A client you are working with discloses a behaviour that concerns you. What do you do? Now, loads of interview questions are like this. 
it's massively open and massively vague, actually, because it could be anything. It could be that uh, the behaviour is self-harming. It could be that they're drinking too much. It could be that they're having an inappropriate or dangerous or illegal sexual relationship. It could be anything. Um, so while it's I really like to go like really specific with things, but actually with a question like this, you need to think of different scenarios. Um, so what they're testing with these scenario questions, all right, they're testing your competencies. So how do you manage risk in this particular one? What is your level of knowledge and skill? Like what is your level of knowledge about what you should do with disclosures? Um, what's your experience? Have you ever had any experience with this? Um, and they're also testing whether you'll fit in with the team, whether your initial reaction is to fit, is to do something that is consistent with the team. Little sidebar, when I was interviewing once, it was the funniest interview and I feel awful, but it was just unbelievable what this person said. We were interviewing and um, we said, uh, some, the question was something like, uh, the team's, we were interviewing for a team leader role and the question was, the team's performance um, is uh, has not met targets for the last two months. What do you do? And the person immediately said, I would sack the entire staff, the whole team. Um, I was just like, oh, um, okay. But what that showed us is that um, their answer is quite a nuclear response. It's, you know, quite out there. There was no uh, plan in place. And as a team leader, you kind of have to be a couple of steps ahead. You have to be thinking, this is my plan A. What if plan A doesn't work? I need to think of a plan B, plan C, all of that. So, yeah, don't do that. I'd really encourage you to take a minute to think. <laughs> um, so an example answer, I would say something like, OK, I've experienced some things like this. Uh, in my previous roles, particularly in substance misuse, we often dealt with difficult disclosures um, that really varied. Um, and depending on the disclosure, I would probably react differently. And that's probably something that I would consider is, is what the behaviour is that concerns me. But I would find out more information if I can, you know, some history, um, the severity, the risk factors that are involved. I, you know, establish a safety plan with that person as well. Um, so if the behaviour were, you know, was self-harm, I would think about, OK, so what what usually precipitates the self-harm? What do you usually do? Are there any times where you've avoided doing the self-harm? Can we try and implement some of those things? Who could you call? Could you call the service? Could you call a friend? Could you call Samaritans? I don't know. Could you, you know, anybody that you could call? I'd also inform them of their confidentiality situation and my obligation to raise risk concerns um with my with my supervisor because that's just part of my role and usually it's something that they have agreed to as well you know as, as agreeing to come into treatment um so i would tell them a little bit about what would happen um once i've got as much information i would say to them okay thank you so much for sharing um i do need to share that with my supervisor um just to make sure that i'm giving you the best advice possible and that we're looking after you as well as we can um, that's usually a massive tick box as well. Um, I would document the risks um, in the case notes, in a thorough risk assessment, in the care plan, in the safety plan. I would raise the concerns immediately with my supervisor, depending on how difficult the risk was. You know, if it was an immediate concern, uh, an immediate issue, then I would raise it immediately. Uh, if it's something that I could do the notes first and then go and speak to my supervisor afterwards, then that's what I would do. It really depends on the situation. Um, I'd follow any of the procedures. So lots of services have different safeguarding procedures and um, alerts procedures that they have to follow. Um, I'd link with other agencies if I had to, and I would keep the client informed of the processes. So I'd explain to them what the steps were that we would have to follow, what the possibilities are, and I would keep them informed. So if I'd referred them to safeguarding, I would tell them that, you know, you remember we were talking about that safeguarding possible referral that has happened. I have done the referral. You, this is what's going to happen next. And then I would reflect on the experience when the immediate risk has sort of been managed as well as I can. I would spend some time thinking about it myself and then I would sort of bring it up in supervision. That's the main thing I would do. So as you can see in that, it's not necessarily a structure. What you're doing is talking through what you would actually do. And you're thinking of the clear steps that you would follow. And these are the sort of competencies and knowledge and skills that are coming up there. All right. There's loads of them. Absolutely loads. As you can see, I ended with a little bit of reflective practice so that I'd bring it to supervision. 
confidentiality is a huge thing. Um, ethics goes hand in hand with that. MDT working, risk assessment, keeping accurate records. All of this stuff are gonna be tick boxes in that marking scheme. That's why it's really important. Here are a couple of other scenario questions um, that will hopefully help you understand what I mean by a scenario. Um, you receive a professional referral for a child with anger issues who is considered manipulative and needs one-to-one -one work. How do you respond to this? And this, when they're using words like manipulative in the referral, they're kind of testing what your values are as well. Because I, I've had this question in an interview and I personally feel that manipulative is not particularly an acceptable word to use, particularly for a child. I think that's a very emotive language to and provocative language to use um, and not professional. So that was part of my answer. You receive a referral for a child with learning disabilities who is banging his head. What do you do to ensure you work best with the child? You're in an MDT meeting and a disagreement breaks out between two staff, uber common. Um, what do you do? Those sorts of questions. More, here we go, some more examples. You attend your first staff consultation meeting. The response to every suggestion you make is, we've tried that and it didn't work. What do you do? You receive, um, sorry, a client you're working with in a one-to-one -one session becomes aggressive. What do you do? Here, you're talking about, you know, loan working procedures, risk management, making sure you sat by the door, making sure that you read all the previous notes, debriefing with the staff, de-escalating the situation, um, you know, all of that stuff. This one, you're experiencing some issues with your supervisor. How do you address these? This might be a more common topic for a doctorate interview. It's not a question that I've come across, but it might be more topical for that. A client of yours is disengaged and you're not able to contact them. What would you do? Um, this is very common in particular groups like substance misuse. We used to have clients disengage all the time and we were unable to reach them. So depending on the population, um, that will be based on the scenario questions. Now we're gonna move on to some top tips, okay? Some really practical information, and then I will let you leave, I promise. Um, so top tips, don't over prepare. I cannot impress this upon you guys enough. When I first did, I, when I first got my first doctorate interview particularly, but I used to do this for all AP interviews, but when I got my first doctorate interview, I wrote a notebook like this, two notebooks, one of these and another half one of these, full of notes that I was supposed to be able to remember. I can't remember all those notes. I don't, I, you can't remember all of that. Don't over prepare because your brain will just be a mush and you won't be able to pick out any relevant information. Don't over prepare. It's okay. What is better preparation is to sort of relax actually. Some things that you can do to do a little bit of preparation, though, is to research the service, the trust, the company, you know, their history, their values, any news stories that have come up or their CQC report. Even if there's a CQC report, um, that can be really helpful. Do an informal call. So a lot of the time on job adverts, they have contact information for the person that's advertising the job. Um, and you can call them up and just say, hi, um, I've applied for this job. I've actually got an interview and I just want to find out a little bit more about the service and what's going on at the moment. Anything. Just an informal call because it helps put a face to a name almost or a voice to a name. Um, and I've definitely been advised to do this before by um, in, in feedback that I've had from interviews. Don't memorise your answers. It, just don't memorise your answers. At best, you risk coming across over rehearsed and stiff and inhuman. Um, at worst, it, you forget and then you, you look foolish because you can't formulate what you want to say. So don't memorise your answers. Have a couple of vignettes or case studies prepared. Yeah, so uh, a research activity that you've done, a clinical experience you've had that went well, one that went badly. Just a couple, because lots of questions, you can adapt these case studies, lots of them. So just have a couple of those. And have some good questions prepared for the end of the interview. You know, everyone's going to ask, uh, when, when do we expect to hear? What does a working day look like? You know, have some good questions prepared, something out of the box, something interesting. Here are some top tips for during the interview, okay? As I've said, I am a fantastically anxious person usually. So this is something that really helps, taking a breath before I start my answer. 
I'm the sort of person that used to go into an exam and do a brain dump is what I called it. Okay. So I would like on my answer book, I would draw a line and I would then just write down all of the random things that were in my head, either from cramming or anything that I could remember in my answer book. And then I could be like, oh, okay, I've got that all out. And that's kind of what a, taking a deep breath does. It kind of helps me focus. So I definitely encourage you once they've asked the question or when they're asking the question, even breathe really deeply. Um, that can be helpful. Um, name your feelings. Name your feelings. It is okay to be nervous. Say it. Say to them, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm really nervous. Um, this is really difficult doing it online um, or, you know, anything like that. Write notes if it's helpful. Like I say, do a brain dump. Structure your answer. Okay. Use the star. Use the reflective models. Definitely consider what are the top three most important things, top five, and list them. You don't have to hit every base, but having a structure is a way nicer way to listen to an answer. And try to think about what the question is actually asking you. Really think about it. So if you're getting a competency question, you can try and think about that or a scenario question. Okay, well, what are they testing? They're testing how I can manage risk. They're testing how I can care plan. They're testing how I can use supervision. All of those things, think about and try and hit them if you can if you, in your answer. And for afterwards, after the dreaded interview, write the questions down. This is something that I do because now I've got a massive list of potential questions that could come up in an assistant interview or a doctor interview. I always like to write the questions down. Usually when I come out of the interview room or finish, I just write, write all of the questions down because I guarantee you an hour later, you will struggle to remember. I will anyway. I always do. Reward yourself. Interviews are really stressful. Like buy yourself something nice have a nice, have a favourite drink, have a glass of wine, if that's, if that's your tipple, do, you know, have a nice meal, reward yourself for getting through it, regardless of what the outcome is. Spend some time reflecting on the experience and your answers. You know, sometimes I write down the bullet points of things that I've covered in my answers, and then I can think, oh, what else could I have covered? And then I, you know, you can learn that way. You can do it verbally, you can do it reflective models, you can do it freehand using a video diary. Just spend some time thinking about what happened in the interview. Anticipate the feedback. What do you think their feedback is going to be? Do you think that you were too waffly? Do you think that you did not structure your answer well enough? Like anticipate what the feedback is and then record the feedback. Any feedback that they give you, positive or negative, write it down. You know, have a feedback log that you can write all that stuff down in and then you can compare what you thought the feedback will be with the feedback that you've got because I've particularly when I first started I thought yeah I've nailed that interview and they were like no you did not know anything <laughs> that sort of thing so actually I had quite a different quite a dissociation between the truth uh, and what I thought so that can be very helpful to getting you back into reality I just want to mention a little bit about self-care um, before we finish as I say, reward yourself is tough. Don't be too hard on yourself. I I cannot, I actually can't count. I, could, I mean, I could go through all my logs and everything, but I, I can't count how many assistant interviews I've been on. It is definitely, definitely over 40. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I interviewed for like four or five years before I got my first assistant job. So yeah, <laughs> like it's it can hurt okay don't be too hard on yourself don't internalize that to mean that you're rubbish what it means is that there's lots of really great candidates out there is actually what that means try not to internalize the lack of success to mean that you're a failure because you're not it's super competitive we're all really level <laughs> make time for yourself you know make sure if you've got an interview in the morning then make sure the night before that you're spending some time for yourself have a bath do what relaxes you or if you feel that the interview didn't go very well and actually you just need a bit of time to like sit and watch Legally Blonde in bed and cry, which is definitely not something I've done before, uh, then do that. Make time for yourself and reflect on your own well-being. Just check in with yourself and say, actually, how am I? What are my needs? Like, what do I need today? That can be really helpful. In summary then, and I appreciate this is an uber long video, so thank you so much for like sticking with it. Um, interviews will include various types of questions, probably based on competencies, knowledge and scenarios. Um, think about what the question is asking you and have example vignettes on hand. That can be really, really helpful. Those are my top like tips, really. But 
the overwhelming message is do not over prepare because you will not succeed that way guaranteed I think that's why it took me so long because I was so like I need to write all the notes and I need to know absolutely everything you don't and actually the more experience you gain in positions like support worker or recovery worker or team leader even which are my that's my pathway um I feel much more competent in answering questions now because I actually have experience to fall back on. But when I was first starting my career, I didn't have any experience. So I didn't really understand. I didn't really understand the dynamics of a multidisciplinary team. I didn't I didn't really understand loads of this stuff. But now I do. You know, I have a better understanding. So, you know, don't wish your life away by thinking, oh, I just wish I could get an AP job and be more experienced. Enjoy the experience that you're getting when you're getting it and really get the most out of it by reflecting. Don't forget that this is our channel here, um, Clinical Psychology Community UK. Make sure you click subscribe. But I'm just including this to draw your attention to some videos. So I've done a full one on NHS assistant psychologist applications. I've also done a five top tips on it as well. Um, this is the Gibbs reflective model one. There's, it also includes Brookfield. And there's the five top tips for getting the most out of your support worker role. How to get involved, as I've said, make sure you follow us on all of the socials there. And here are some references and resources for you, which I will make sure I put down uh, in the comments. And there are some fab channels as well. The Oxford Psych. I imagine all of you have heard of the Oxford Psych. She is fantastic. Her name's Aika, and she is currently in her first year of training in Oxford. We've got V-Psych and Sharon B, who um, are also sort of pre-qualified psychologists um, that have lots and lots of helpful videos on there too. Thank you so much for watching. I can't explain to you how grateful I am to get lots of feedback from people. Um, I really massively appreciate it. So thank you. And I will see you next time for another video. Bye.